Okay, today we're going to have a look around Logic X's channel strips uh, and understand the controls on them. I've got a simple Logic session, only three tracks. One software instrument track, that's the drummer track, one guitar track, one bass track. And over here on the left of the screen, you'll see that it always shows two channel strips. It shows the output and whichever track you've got selected. So if I click on guitar, this one changes to show us the guitar track. If I click on bass, we see the bass track over here. I'll go back to the drums. You can also see the channel strips in the mixer, which normally appears down here. And if you can't see it, click on this icon here and up comes the mixer and I can resize it and decide how much of the arranger window and how much of the mixer I want to see just by doing that. If I rename a channel strip or track by double clicking on it, I could call this software drums. The name change happens here and here as well because they all relate to the same thing. I'm going to change it back to drums. OK. So, at the bottom of an audio track, you see a group of buttons, and the same applies to the bottom of a software instrument track. They're different. We'll come back to the software instrument track later. Let's look at an audio track first. We see I for input, this behaves in a particular way. When it's greyed out like that, when Logic is not playing, that shows me what's coming in on that channel according to the input that we've set in its input box, which we'll look at in a minute. That's currently listening to input 1 and 2, and you can see that when I talk, it shows up there. If I set that to no input, that will stop registering sound. OK? If I put it back to input 1 and 2, it sees me talking. But as soon as I hit play, instead of the meters showing me what's coming in, they'll show me what's playing on that track. So I'm going to stop talking, I'm going to hit play, They now show me what's happening on that track. However, if I click in, they now show me what's happening on that track. However, I need to pull the volume fader down. If I hit input, it shows me what's coming in. And even when I click play, it still only shows me what's coming in, not what's recorded on the track. OK, that's the input button. I'll put that back. The next button is R for record. This actually stands for record arm because it doesn't go into record until you click record on the transport. But that readies it for recording. It makes it ready for recording. Any tracks that have the R button lit up red, when I go into record, that track will be recorded on. The mute button for M mutes that track. So if I play the uh, uh, hit play, then hit mute, it's muted that guitar. I'll unmute it, hit mute again. And then we have the solo button. This solos the tracks. You might think of that as muting all the others. So if I hit play and then hit solo, it's muted all the other tracks. And you can see M is flashing. And I'm only hearing the guitar. Okay. 
let's move up. Next thing we saw was this volume fader. We know what this does. It turns this track up or down. Then we have a pan pot. This pans the instrument left and right in the stereo spectrum. You can set it back to exact center by holding down the Alt key and clicking on the control. Same with volume faders. If I want to set it to zero, hold down the Alt key and click on the fader. Okay. <coughs> Further up the channel strip, we have this button, which converts, uh, switches the track between mono and stereo. The bass track, for example, we can see this track here. I'm just going to put this up there so we can see it completely. The bass track is in mono, the guitar track's in stereo, but if I do that, it switches it to a mono track, and you can see that it's gone back to just one meter. Back to stereo. There we are. We can see where it is. Okay, and then beside that, we have the input select button. This tells this track what input to listen to. And if I click and hold it, I can see a list of all of the inputs available on my system, plus a list of buses. We'll talk about those later. Plus an option for no input. And this works in conjunction with Logic's preferences. If we go to the Logic Pro X menu, preferences, and select audio, and select the devices tab, we can see all the inputs and outputs that are connected to this system. So for example, an input device, I could select between the built-in digital input or the built-in line input or the inputs of any interface that I've got connected to the computer or on some computers, a built-in microphone. Uh, if you change that, you need to click Apply Changes, wait for it to come back and then close. Okay, so I've only got inputs one and two on this system. I can select either uh, one and two if it's a stereo track, or if I make it a mono track, input one or input one and uh, input two. The output here allows us to select either no output or output stereo output or mono outputs one or two or selection of buses or surround outputs and binaural outputs. We'll leave it set to stereo output for the moment. Okay. The way the signal flows through this channel strip is that if you've got an instrument plugged into it and you're recording, it comes in at the input, goes through these insert points, which we'll look at in a minute, goes through the volume fader, through the pan fader, and then is routed to the outputs. So let's look at these insert points. This is where you can put plugins and effects across the track. If I click and hold here, a list of plugins appears. I'm going to choose for this guitar, let's choose an amp. Okay, I'm going to put it into solo so we can hear the guitar really cleanly. change the sound of my guitar. I can bypass it to compare. Okay. 
I can then put another effect onto the next insert. So I might choose to put a delay. Let's just use a simple tape delay. Logic gives you a couple of um, preset ones here. If I take that tape delay off uh, so we can hear clearly what's going on. This is an EQ plugin that's already on the channel. I can use this to analyze the sound. I can see what's present in the frequency spectrum of this sound. For example, that little peak there. And dial it out using the EQ. I can bypass it. Put it back on. I can keep stacking up inserts. I can put a compressor on after this, for example. Let's just put a standard compressor on. So, those are the inserts. We've looked at EQ. We need to look at a software instrument track. I'm going to go to my drum track here take the guitar out of solo, put the drums into solo. Software instrument tracks have different settings, mainly here in the input section. You cannot select one of the audio inputs here. All you can do is select either no plugin or one of the many synths. So for example, if I set, uh, turn, change this to a synth, Choose a preset. That's good enough. I'll set it back to the drum kit. I thought that was uh, probably better for this. But otherwise, it has all the same things. We've got insert points, so we can put an EQ on it. Compressor. I could even put a guitar amp over the drum kit if I wanted to. We have the same output options. No output, stereo output, surround, or any of the bus outputs. The same pan pot, volume fader, mute and solo buttons, but we don't have an input button and we don't have a record button on a software instrument track. Okay, that's a quick tour around Logic's channel strips. You'll notice that they're actually all the same when you look at them, they all do the same thing, and it's the same in Pro Tools, Cubase, any other um, digital audio workstation, they all do the same stuff. They just make the knobs different colors.